Hi there, welcome to the Cannabis Corner. I'm your host, Carrie A. Burns. I'm sure many of you out there know the history of the cannabis plant and something you've read or the written history of word, or maybe through your own experiences, you've uh, managed to find out some of the beneficial qualities of this plant. And that's the purpose of the Cannabis Corner. We're here to talk about the beneficial aspects of this plant and also to do a fairly lengthy history study of the law and and the statistics that the law has generated and uh, to show that there is no foundation or basis for the laws that uh, make cannabis illegal in the United States of America and in most places of the world. Uh, cannabis use dates back beyond the Egyptians, the Phoenicians, they were all there were uh, they were all cultures that used hemp. They used uh, they made many different products, mainly clothing and different uh, types of textiles from the uh, stalks, the fibers from the stalks. Uh, but many of them also used it for medicinal purposes and also for social events, much like today as the uh, cannabis uh, culture out there today uses in smoking marijuana to get high or cannabis. Uh, Columbus, uh, it's a documented fact that the ships that Columbus sailed over on, uh, the ropes and all of the sails and all of the goods and clothing that was worn was uh, made from hemp. And uh, in, when the Jamestown colonies were first founded in the early 1600s, it was, it was actually required by the colonists to grow hemp. You, this was one of the main stays of the colony and hemp production was one of the things that you were required to do if you were a citizen of the, of the United States, the early United States then. Um, during the uh, few years that, uh, were, that led up to the beginning of when they made, formed the Marijuana Tax Act in 1937, prior to this period, there were quite a few events going on in America. Uh, we'd just gone through the Great Depression. Uh, there were many people that were out of work. There were, uh, uh, 1935, we had the uh, the big Dust Bowl problem in the in the midwestern part of the United States, where the over agriculture had caused these giant dust storms and actually removed all the growing topsoil from the soil. And so, and there were people were really in suffering hard times during this period. There were no jobs. Uh, what few jobs there were, they didn't pay very much, and most of the most of the people depended on farming. So when the when the idea came up in 1935 that they were going to, that there were some secret talks going on about uh, ratifying a, a tax on hemp production and make it even more difficult for the farmers, this didn't set very well with uh, with most of the people and the citizens back then. Um, the 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 problem with the Marijuana Tax Act uh, in its early stages, which began in early 1935. The, uh, there were private meetings being held. This wasn't something that was open to the public uh, for discussion. There were actually, a, there, were, there, was, there were many uh, uh, senators involved in this, up to 15 or 20 f at different times during the proceedings and hearings. They always met behind closed doors. They didn't ever allow anybody to come in and really offer any scientific data, any, any really valid information. It was just this discussion among these people that were pretty much controlled by the business elite at the time. Uh, Randolph, William Randolph Hearst, he was a huge, huge uh, tycoon at this point in time. He owned a lot of paper mills and stuff. Certainly he stood to lose quite a bit if uh, hemp paper production went into full swing. Uh, and, and it certainly would have been because it, the uh, production of the hemp paper uh, in a given acre, of, if you planted an acre of hemp for 20 years and harvested the cellulose fibers from that and the pulp necessary to make paper, you would have an amount four times uh, of any tree that you could grow in that same given period on that same amount of land. So hemp was cheaper to produce the, the paper fibers that were needed to produce the paper. Uh, you know, 75% cheaper. What would that have done to the people supplying the timbers? And since Randolph Hearst was a big timber supplier, he owned vast amounts of timber lands, he was certainly was one that stood to gain if, if uh, something could have been done to make sure that hemp couldn't be produced in the United States. This was just one example. Uh, the fellow that uh, was, in, was actually our first drug czar, Harry Anslinger, he was the nephew of, of a then uh, big time banker known as Andrew Mellon. He owned the Mellon Bank and Trust. And one of the bank and trust 
biggest projects was the DuPont Chemical Company. And during this time, DuPont had acquired the, the patents for uh, Orlon, Dacron, and Rayon. Uh, these were synthetic fibers that were made from hydrocarbon and uh, they were developed by the Germans, but DuPont managed in their wheeling and dealing to get the patents from the Germans. But their problem was that they couldn't compete with the hemp fibers. Not only could they, the strength of those materials in no way compared to the strength of the hemp fibers, but the, the cost to produce them was much, much higher than growing the hemp. Plus it kind of took the, the job away from the farmers that grew the hemp to produce the different fibers for various products, such as clothing and rope, etc. <clears throat> so Andrew Mellon, he's during this period in 1930, he's the Secretary of Treasury under, under Hoover, and um, he decides to appoint his nephew, Harry Anslinger, as the head of the Bureau of Narcotics. At the time, uh, there was a the there was not a drug enforcement agency. The uh, the government agency that oversaw narcotic activity was called the Federal Bureau of Narcotics. And Mellon appoints his own nephew. Talk about nepotism now. Appoints his own nephew as the head of the Bureau of Narcotics. And you know, Anslinger was one of these kind of guys. He he kind of had the Hitler complex. He was a little short guy. He, uh, many of the people that uh, knew him back then, you know, they talked about that he seemed like he had something to prove and they felt like really that the, the culmination of the Marijuana Tax Act seven years after he was appointed head of the Federal Bureau of Narcotics probably was just a, in, in a most attempt was just to, for him to prove himself, if you will. Uh, there was a lot of talk, of course, in Randolph Hearst, his newspapers, they were running stories all the time about the dangers of marijuana, that the uh, people smoking it were getting high, and then they'd go out and commit violent crimes, even murder, rape, raping the white girls. It made the, uh, made the black men so horny that they just couldn't stay away from white girls. And I mean, there were stories like this. I mean, you know, y'all seen the movie Reefer Madness and how silly that is today when you watch it. These were, that, when that movie came out, that was actually meant to be serious and they were trying to make the public think that marijuana really was this giant scare that everybody needed to be, you know, worried about. And of course, along with that, you get all of these stories that are absolutely not true. None of them found it and certainly none of the scientific community was behind any of that crap as they put it out and there was plenty of it. I mean, it, and uh, <clears throat> so, Leading up to the time before the actual ratification of the act in, in uh, August of 1937, there was a lot, of, a lot of goings on, if you will, and most of it was crooked dealings. There were, there were they, even Anslinger himself, he didn't actually, wasn't the one that came up with the tax. And by the way, the tax, the original purpose of the tax was to, was to generate revenue. It was kind of like the Harrison Act of 1914 that regulated narcotics and stuff in the country. That act pretty much was a revenue uh, generating act. And the Marijuana Tax Act, one of, uh, of uh, Anslinger's uh, deputy clerks was a fellow named Oliphant. And he's the one that made the suggestion about taxing the hemp transactions. Not only the, ta you had to pay a dollar tax back then, you had to pay a dollar tax if you were a farmer on every transaction that you did. And, you know, at the time, a dollar, that really wasn't that big a deal, and people really weren't too worried about paying the tax and stuff. But what they failed to mention was that if you didn't keep detailed records, and you had to, you had to give the list of, of everybody that bought the hemp, you had to, every doctor that prescribed the cannabis, I mean, you had to give detailed records of every transaction, where these people lived, how much, the, how much you gave them, all that. And if you left out one bit of information, they fined you $5,000 and you faced a possible jail term. You probably faced a possible jail term of up to five years in prison. And so when people started looking at that, I was like, my God, if I just forget to write down one little thing here, they're gonna come throw me in prison or something. So the, it, was the, it was an attempt by the powers that be to really uh, thwart this in a way that they knew people would stay away from it because they didn't want to be in prison over something that had been legal up until then. Uh, there never really was any big discussion about the dangers of marijuana. 